I'm so glad everyone is here tonight. I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the fact that we in Philadelphia are located on the lands of the Lenny Lenape people. My name is Layla Cartier. I am the executive director of Craft Now Philadelphia. If you're not familiar with us, we are in our seventh year of programming and we are thrilled to share this virtual platform with you that not only allows for a kind of casual industry night where our gallery friends might be back in their spaces on Friday nights, hopefully someday soon, um, but we also can expand beyond Old City with our presenters and the audiences we are able to reach. I would like to announce that we have enabled the closed caption feature with the help from our friends at Disability Pride PA. So if you look at the bottom menu on your screen and click on the CC, you can um, follow along with the auto transcription. It's not gonna be perfect, but I'm really excited to be exploring ways to make our programs more accessible. So thank you so much for that. And as a disclaimer, this is a public Zoom link. We have never had a Zoom bomber. I don't know if that's fortunately or unfortunately because we love to live on the edge here in Philadelphia. So be prepared for anything unusual to happen. And we're gonna ask that you all stay on mute right now to avoid background noise while our presenters are talking, but we're gonna uh, invite you to unmute at the end of the presentation so we can have a conversation together. But in the meantime, you are welcome to put any questions uh, in the chat and we will try to get to them. We are keeping each presentation to about 10 minutes to make sure we have time for everyone. And with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Casey at Manitani Stillworks, who is making a cocktail for us tonight. All right, everyone. Welcome back. Good to see everyone's faces. Happy April 1st, April Fools. No jokes here. We're making a real drink. Um, so I've got some good news to get us started here. And that is that the spirit that we'll be using, our Manitani Honey Whiskey, um, is going to be available now to you uh, in most of your local state stores. Um, so if you can't get to one of the Manitani locations very easily, uh, you can check in by calling over to your local Pennsylvania Wine and Spirits or check on their website. Uh, that is going to be available now for you guys. So when you're ready to make this cocktail, just swing it out, over and grab it. Uh, today we are making our Hot in the City cocktail. Uh, this one is quite delicious. Um, so think honey whiskey, some mint, some citrus, some sugar, shake it up real good and enjoy. Uh, I'm going to start out here with our main spirit which is that honey whiskey. I'm gonna use two ounces of that guy and build in. I'll work in next with an ounce of simple syrup, an ounce of citrus. And then last but not least, we are also pairing with our uh, good friends over at Rival Brothers who happen to be our neighbors down here on Passion Avenue. And we're using their green tea, but Feel free to substitute mint tea if you kind of want to bring out a little more of the mint flavor. And I'm going to fill that in with two ounces of our green tea. I'm also going to toss some fresh mint into my shaker here. Give just a little squeeze to start bringing out some of the aromatics. And obviously we need some ice. To get this guy going. And for this one, it's supposed to be a light refreshing drink. If you're looking to build out a little more of the spirit, um, feel free to strain this out and drink it in a smaller profile up. But I'm going to go right into our glass here. And obviously, we want to garnish it with some fresh mint. Just give it a little tap again to bring out those lovely smells. And you've got you're hot in the city. Please, again, stop by our tasty room to grab a bottle of honey whiskey or other spirits or stop by your local state store. Thanks again for Manitani. Love you guys. Can't wait to do it again next month. Thank you so much. I love your different cocktail every month. And as a girl closely connected to Kentucky, I do love mint in brown liquor. 
<laughs> so thank you, Manitani Steelworks. And now that we have settled in, we are gonna make our way to our first presenter and we are going in alphabetical order. Joining us is the new director of Camden Fireworks, Asaya Kurtz, an applied anthropologist and graduate researcher in the field of cultural sustainability. She is a self-taught maker and quilter and accustomed to taking seemingly disparate items and weaving them together to create solutions that address macro issues. I am really looking forward to this presentation. Awesome, thank you so much. Let's get my screen shared. Uh, here we go. And hang on. There we go. So um, as Layla said, I'm Asaya Kurtz and I am the new executive director for Camden Fireworks. I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. So thank you so much for the invitation to come in and, and share with you. Um, but I wanted to just First, before I kind of kick it off, I want to um, invite everyone here to be a part of A New View Camden. Um, that is, of course, where Camden Fireworks is located. Um, our organization is a um, curatorial partner with the City of Camden, with Cooper Ferry, Cooper's Ferry Partnership, Rutgers, and Bloomberg Philanthropies. And what this does is this public art um, endeavor addresses a real issue in Camden, and that's illegal dumping. Um, what there are, uh, what you can expect is that there are six sites, and these sites were chosen because they are where people dump repeatedly. And I'm talking not small items, I'm talking like kind of industrial waste where the EPA has to be involved. Um, so there are a number of different um, sites that will have a number of different kind of media that is used. Uh, typically, it's all going to be recycled or repurposed items. But if you want to know more information, I ask that you go to the website, which is anewviewcandon.com. So as Layla said, I am a quilter, I am self-taught, and I'm very proud of being self-taught, um, at least for a for three generations prior to my joining this earth, uh, there is no documentation saying that there was anyone in my family who was a quilter. Um, and there is no one in my family, hence, who is a quilter. So when babies are born or something needs to be commemorated, people come to me, which is not a big deal unless you have 10 children <laughs> and you're expecting 10 quilts, then that's not, that's not gonna happen. Um, but, uh, I really, many quilters hold to this where they name their quilts. And I do that, but I do it for a reason that really doesn't point to me. It really points to the creative process. Uh, as I said, I am, you know, uh, the only quilter in the entirety of my family. There is no ancestor who uh, did engage in this work. And because there are ancestors of mine as a black woman descendant of enslaved people whose names I don't know, is very important for me to name the things that I love. And so these are a few of the things that I've, that I've created. Um, I also am a maker. I don't just work on, um, on quilted or textile fabrics or those types of things. I also build furniture. Uh, I've done leather working. I've made baskets. And the quilt on the left is a wall hanging that is also a, um, it's a checkerboard. And I collaborated with a gentleman from where I'm from back in the South uh, who hand carved the checker pieces and dyed them for me. So I was really excited to, to be part of that collaborative work with him. I prescribe to the Octavia Butler School of Thought that there is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. And this is important for me as a leader in Camden that I am cognizant of the need to think about things in a completely different way. Um, illegal dumping and environmental injustice is prevalent, 
but it doesn't have to be that way. We can search out new constellations of thought and art is a great way to intervene, to interrogate why things are the way they are and to start a dialogue. And so I believe that art allows us not to see ourselves for who we are, but really to think about who we could be. Camden Fireworks is Black-led, it's community-based. We are in the Waterfront South District, and our mission really is to grow, gather, and invest in the artists who, who are situated where we are. And we use a three-pronged approach. We are looking at bonding, bridging, and building. Uh, we do the bonding by offering very, very reasonable rates for artists to um, rent our studio spaces. And we use bridging to really reach out to the community. We are intentional about being inclusive. Um, and then we look at building relationships with other nonprofits, other institutions, uh, people who may have not, they may not know who we are. So we are being intentional about offering our firehouse, which is, you know, was the home of engine number three in Camden. We offer that for any sort of creative events. Most recently, we had a really cool event to celebrate the arrival of spring. We had Cesar Viveras, an artist who, who came and he talked about um, the way that he is reclaiming abandoned spaces using art. Uh, he talked about Mesoamerican cultural traditions and we capped it off with a drum and dance ensemble. It was amazing um, and it was a beautiful day. So that was, that was awesome too. We had a lot of fun socially distanced. We are a few, you know, small team, but we get a lot of work done. And we uh, really work very hard to support artists and artists to be in the Camden community. Um, how can you stay in touch with us? Hit us up on the socials, um, Instagram, Facebook, we have a new LinkedIn account. Uh, only have six followers, but help us get that up. Um, and also, you know, check out our website. It's in transition, um, but we hope to unveil a new look for that in the next uh, couple of weeks. So with that, I just want to thank you again for allowing me to be part of this gathering. Um, if you have you know, questions or anything, you want to reach out to me directly. Here's my information and um, I'm going to kick it back to Lou. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. I'm curious, how many artist studios do you have there? We have nine. Um, we have one that's currently vacant uh, and soon to be hopefully one more, um, but you know, they, they range in size. So if you don't need much space, we have very small spaces, but we have um, a, a resident artist, Hope Mead, who is actually on staff. She's a third generation, I believe, ceramicist, and she has a fantastic studio. Uh, she has the largest space. So we really are interested in seeing the growth of our artists from those smaller spaces to you know, being able to scale up in our roof. We have one other question in the chat. Can you talk a minute about your public exhibitions? So in the past, I mean, and, and on our website, you can check out years of past exhibitions that we've done. Uh, it's been very much a grassroots effort looking at local artists that our focus is local people to the community. Um, right now, everything is virtual just because, you know, the pandemic. But what we've tried to do is at least continue our um, virtual open studios so that we maintain that connection to the community. Uh, and we are maintaining that connection to our artists by planning for exhibits to happen. Um, and our focus really going forward for the foreseeable future is going to be environmental justice. So we are looking to partner with artists to help us interrogate that. Um, and so just stay tuned to us so you can see, you know, how we grow in that way. I love hearing that. I'm it's really exciting. Okay, well, thank you. We're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, quickly, I want to mention that our friends at InLiquid have their 
uh, annual benefit opening April 7th through the 11th at the Crane Arts Icebox and Project Space. I'm going to put a link to find out more about that uh, really beloved auction in the chat. Up next, we have our co-host with Disability Pride PA, a nonprofit organization of disabled people and allies imagining a world where every disabled person feels pride through self-awareness, their identity, and the community at large. Vicki Landers and Connie Vanderakis are here to talk with us about their advocacy, programming, and how to access the Arts and Disabled Artists Supply Fund. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen here. And then let me set my timer. Uh, oops. Thank you, Vicki. Wait, whoop, whoop. There we go. Do you see us? <laughs> All right. So let me hit resume. There we go. So uh, we are uh, Disability Pride PA. I'm Connie Vanderakis, and in keeping with accessibility standards, I'm going to describe myself so anybody with low vision or blind can imagine what I might look like. I'm a middle-aged uh, woman with um, long, mostly gray hair. I wear glasses, and I have long earrings, a black shirt, and a scarf on. And behind, uh, we are in Vicky's home. Um, and I'll let Vicki describe herself when and she introduces herself. Um, the first slide has my name on it and there are two people on the left-hand side. Um, I wish I could say I was the person in the sunglasses, but I'm the gray-haired woman on the other side, <laughs> volunteering at our Disability Pride event in 2018. And next to me identifies as a person with col of color uh, queer and uh, neurodivergent. She also happens to be my daughter. Um, so a little bit about me. I um, was in the world of academia for over 30 years at the University of the Arts as a dance professor. And then I went into administration as an associate dean. And then I left in 2018 to dive into the world of international um, disability. Uh, Vicki. Uh, recruited has been recruiting me since I think 2016 and um, last year I joined their board and this year I joined as a staff member so I'm really happy to be here. I work um, in the international world of uh, disability as an inclusive arts expert and um, I, I'm, I, I just love to do the work that I do. Um, I'm going to move the slide and have Vicki introduce herself. Hopefully this will work. Oops, hanging with me, people. Why oh, didn't that work? Oh. <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, Vicki. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Vicki Landers and I am the president, founder and CEO of uh, Disability Pride PA. Um, I am a white woman. Um, today I have my short purple hair sticking out of as my bangs. I have a black beanie and purple glasses and a purple shirt. Yeah, it has a theme. <laughs> <laughs> um, my background is my house. Um, I am into anything vintage, uh, Halloween, creepy, um, and all of that. I see those things in the background of my apartment. Um, so I am very um, excited to be here um, to, to talk to all of you. Um, I have been, I was a, I am a disabled artist. Um, I love recycling um, and using recycled products. Um, disability pride um, has always been something that I, um, I cheer on, I promote, um, because we are proud of ourselves as disabled people. Um, and it's okay to say disabled people um, and the word disability, because it's not a bad word. Um, I am a disabled artist. Um, I am, um, I ran an accessible uh, art studio um, in Philadelphia for four years um, that was inclusive, but it was accessible for folks with disabilities. 
Um, I now am uh, working full time, of course, with my organization. Um, we are a advocacy access and arts and culture um, organization. Um, and I just think that we bring in the arts in all types of ways, including Connie, who is always bringing in some great things. Um, and I work on disability art um, with an organization that um, is working on ending stigma in um, K through 12. Can you change that? I don't do a good job. Oh. <laughs> There you go. All right. So um, disability, were you going to do this slide? Sure. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so just a little bit about us, uh, Disability Pride PA. Uh, we're, like I said, we are an advocacy access and arts and culture organization. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization of disabled people and our allies. Um, our board is 80% disabled people um, because it is important for us to um, uh, be the, the voices that are being heard for what we want. Um, we, we imagine a world where every disabled person feels pride in themselves. Of course, this is what we've been doing. Um, this is what I have been personally working on since 2012. Um, we run a huge disability uh, pride Philadelphia parade um, in the city. We march down Market Street. We have a huge celebration um, at City Hall, hopefully next year. After all of this stuff, we're going to be on the parkway, which will be amazing. Um, uh, one, we're always trying to teach access. Um, we are available for anybody who'd like to learn more about access. Um, our disabled artists and us, and we work um, every day on bringing disability art um, to the world and making it mainstream. Um, and we're always looking for places like yourselves and your organizations that want to um, um, have our have our dis disabled artists be a part of what you're doing because that is what they would love. Um, disability is intersection. It's I I I, I always say that um, disability is the biggest minority group ever. <laughs> um, we take everybody. Um, and that disability is growing day by day. Um, so we are very excited to be here. Um, and I'm gonna let Connie take it over. Okay. So um, one of our big goals is arts and culture. And um, we support um, disabled artists through workshops, events, uh, material scholarships, and a networking resource. Um, we're very proud of the work that we do. Um, we work internationally as well as um, locally. Um, can we change the slide? Because I want to make sure we get this in. Um, so we, in our international events, we highlight um, artists from all kinds of performing and visual arts. Last December 3rd, International Day of Disabled People, um, we highlighted 30 artists and it was a worldwide production that was produced in three different um, continents and uh, was shown worldwide. Um, we do monthly artist series um, where we have performing artists that um, come and play for us. Um, we are working on disabled arts videos and promoting disabled arts as a common uh, language um, throughout um, the narrative of talking about art. Um, we have a disability art supply fund. Um, our friends from Pilot Projects um, partnered with us and they had a silent auction. All the proceeds went to our disabled arts fund. And you can find all of this on our website and I'll share that with you. Um, can we go down one more? Sure. Yeah, thanks. And so these are all the ways that you can connect with us, our website, our social media, and um, we're, our virtual PA is June 21st um, through, the 30th. through the 30th um, this year. And it will be a virtual event um, like last year, uh, but we will be um, spotlighting live events um, that are appropriate 
at times. So I'm just so grateful to share this with all you. If, you, if you're interested in accessibility, if you're a disabled artist, please, please connect with us. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm curious, what is the average uh, grant that you're able to distribute for art supplies? Um, is it $250? We have $250 limit per, our, uh, per entry. Per entry. Um, and when we were always raising money for that fund. And um, so if anybody would like to give to that fund, we have a donate button and you can specifically earmark it for um, our art supply fund as well. We hope that at some point in time that we'll be able to up that funding um, for, for artists um, as we continue to grow and to um, receive money in. And so if, if I know someone that I want to help apply, what does the application look like? It's a simple form. Uh, it's a Google form um, that you can find on our website. And whoops, you oh, just- Right on time. <laughs> you just fill out that form and uh, we'll receive it. Our committee will look at it and then you'll hear the results in about 10 days, I would say the most. Perfect. Well, thanks to you both. And thank you so much for introducing me to the closed captioning on Zoom. Just to remind everyone, if you want to use the closed captioning, the feature is on the menu at the bottom of your Zoom uh, window. So I'm going to be using that uh, from now on. So we're already just one step more accessible. That's really wonderful. Thank you. One thing for you, um, if somebody does not see the CC button at the bottom, if they have three dots um, at the bottom of their screen, they can hit that and it'll say closed captioning just in case they can't find, not every computer or every update has all of the functions for everybody. That's helpful to know, thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to transition again over to the next presenter with a little announcement to let you know that our Thursday, May 6th preview is in conjunction with uh, Carpenters Hall, our nation's oldest craft guild. And together we are bringing you uh, Glenn Adamson, celebrated craft expert to hear more about his new book, Craft and American History. So registration is going to be required for that. And I'm gonna put the link uh, in the chat for you. I hope to see you then. And uh, the ticket, there's one ticket price that includes a copy of the book if you're interested. Our next presenters are Fabric Workshop with the Clay Studio and Jane Irish is here too. Here, we're all starstruck. Um, I hope you enjoyed this glimpse into the upcoming exhibition of Ceramic Works hardcover scheduled to open at the Fabric Workshop and Museum on Friday, April 9th. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer and Christina and Jane. Thank you so much, Layla. Thank you. Excited to be here as usual. Um, I am going to share my screen and hand it over to Christina to talk to you a little bit about the general concept of this exhibition. Cool. Oh, thank you so much. It's so can you hear me? It's so wonderful to be here tonight with all of you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, my name is Christina Roberts. I'm the Director of Education at the Fabric Workshop and Museum, and I'll be joined with Jennifer Zwilling, the curator at the Clay Studio, and Philadelphia artist Jane Irish. So I'm going to talk really fast, try to cram as much as I can in five minutes <laughs> about our upcoming exhibition, Hardcover. And you can go to the next slide. Hardcover is a group exhibition. And it includes um, connecting our past artists and residents um, working at the Fabric Workshop in the 80s and the 90s, Betty Woodman, Toshiko Takaezu, um, Viola Fry, whose work in the ceramic field really broke away from function and moved more towards contemporary art. And hardcover will include um, their projects from our collection and some um, also some borrowed works from foundations and new works by five contemporary artists and in residents, including Jane Irish, who's gonna talk about her residency experience at the Clay Studio and the Fabric Workshop next, um, and Woody De Othello, Mark Barrow and Sarah Park and Shino Takeda. This is an image of, um, hard, well, hardcover <laughs> is an exhibition that looks closely at the relationship of 
uh, between time and experimental process and, and space. And pictured here, we have uh, Viola Fry in her Oakland, California studio in the 90s. And next is Woody DeAthello, who's also in their um, Oakland studio in 2021, 31 years apart. You can go to the next slide. So included in hardcover will be a version of Viola Fry's 1992 exhibition, Artist Mind Studio World, where at the Fabric Workshop, uh, she collaborated with Marianne Friel to produce a very vibrant um, wallpaper that you see in the background on the left. And there was one of her signature iconic figurative sculptures, Pink Lady. Um, and on the right, you'll see a scene from our 11th and Vine Street studios with Marianne Friel and Virgil Marty, who are master printers, who produced the beautiful um, fat, um, wallpaper that you see in the background. You can go to the next slide. Oh, that's Virgil. Yeah, and it's a similar scene today. You'll see our big, long, 20 yard long print tables with our uh, present day master printers on the right slide, you'll see uh, Zach Ingram on the right and Avery Lawrence on the left, producing new yardage by Woody De Othello that's gonna be included in their living room tableau in hardcover along with some of their new uh, ceramic work that you'll see on the left the, um, titled Co Face Covering, oh no, Covering Face, sorry. And he's examining his time this past year in quarantine. You can go to the next slide. So in the uh, late 70s, when the Fabric Workshop started and early 80s, a typical residency at the workshop was about three weeks long. And whatever an artist could produce in that three weeks, um, and it was usually very like fabric-based and experimental silkscreen, um, and then they would sew and construct it into something that became their project. So in this slide, you'll see working around the same iconic light table that's 40 uh, some years old now, <laughs> uh, Betty Woodman on the left is working with uh, project coordinator Lucy Michaels on her fabric design. And on the right in 2021, you see Elizabeth Clay working with Zach Ingram on her yardage design. You can go to the next slide. And this is a scene from the past. <laughs> uh, Betty Lee Craft is a local fiber artist. She worked for about 10 years at the Fabric Workshop and she worked closely with um, Betty, uh, or Betty Woodman, the two Bettys. And on the right, we have Avery and Zach producing the yardage for Elizabeth Clay. So you can go to the next slide. And this is the finished work by Betty Woodman on the left that'll be included in hardcover. Um, it's called Tarandot doorway and in the background you'll see her earthenware pillow pictures and on the right is the exhibition solo exhibition by Elizabeth Clay and it's on view currently and it's in conjunction with hardcover and she produced three new yardages for this exhibition and included her beautiful uh, black and white ceramic sculptures with the exhibition it's, it's quite beautiful uh, you can go to the next slide in 1990, we worked with Toshiko Takeizu and she would take turns. She would come to the fabric workshop for her residency project. And sometimes we got to go to her beautiful studio and home in Flemington, New Jersey. And so she would work on her mylars in her studio. And you can see, this is a scene from 1990 on the left. And on the right, we made a recent visit to her studio to pick up some of her ceramic moon balls that she's known for to include in the exhibition. And I have to say her spirit was still there. The moon balls on the left are her ceramic moon balls that she's known for that were, that'll be included in the exhibition. And on the right is her residency project that screen printed soft moons that um, vary in size, and but you can see the beautiful colors that she used. You can go to the next slide. And new works by Shino Takeda, who's pictured in the center, will have some ceramic sculptures suspended from the ceiling and a large scale monoprinted fabric that she produced at the workshop. And husband and wife team, Sarah 
Park and Mark Barrow on the right. Um, Sarah is a tapestry weaver and Mark is a painter and they collaborate on these really intricate, beautifully designed tapestries. And they were thinking about the vessel as a metaphor um, for this exhibition. And Karen Patterson, the curator thought to pull uh, Louise Bourgeois' pregnant woman sculpture um, to pair with this piece. So it should be a really beautiful exhibition. And I am excited for you to hear from Jane Irish next, who's gonna talk about her residency experience at the Fabric Workshop and also at the Clay Studio. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Um, I wanted to introduce everyone to Jane Irish. And um, since we don't have too much time, I'm not going to read you her bio, but encourage you to go um, to the Locks Gallery website to see that. And also to note that um, one of her shows there just closed, and she's also included in the New Grit exhibition that's going to be opening at the Philadelphia Museum of Art soon. So, Jane, um, do you want to? Tell us a little bit about um, the work that you did to collaborate between this idea of ceramics and um, screen printing and maybe some of the connections that you saw. We don't have too much time left, but um, that's important to talk about. Sure. And hello, everyone. Um, I am so I'm so pleased to be invited to be in this collaboration and residency and um, I I do both ceramic and painting and in a way I I've always been inspired by decorative arts so I think of fabric as part of uh, the same source of uh, creativity as clay it's like uh, or um, uh, decorative arts, like a porcelain period, like French porcelain or something. Um, so the inspirations of those two like overlap and become more and more interwoven for me. Um, and I guess the, it started with uh, doing some drawings and having uh, Karen and um, Jennifer, the curators, come to my studio. But uh, when I arrived at, I did in September, I was at the fabric workshop and uh, I walk into the, the studio and they set aside some, uh, the giant silk screens for me uh, to work on. And in the shelf next to it was like Mary Hellman and uh, Kiki Smith's name on their screen. So it was like, wow. Uh, just the context of being inspired in the same room as these great artists, uh, just uh, legacies. So, um, and the just working with master printers is like amazing. Um, like I can, uh, you know, a, a painter is usually in their studio by themselves, and it's such a great thing to be among a group of people, especially right after the COVID scare was over. You know, we had this pocket of time. Um, so, uh, and that that's a that's yeah. sort of something that relates, I think, screen printing and ceramics. That idea that you have to kind of be doing it as a team. Yeah. So, um, kind of bringing in a person an artist who is, it's not your normal medium, you you have that um, support system. And I'm just gonna point out, this is uh, your finished yardage that um, was produced at the fabric workshop for your show. And um, I thought you were mentioning decorative arts, if you wanted to talk a little bit about these pieces, and then I'll just kind of go back and forth so people can see that it's a painting that you've created that then is, you've translated it also into ceramics. Yeah. I usually start with a pattern book, which is like the idea of almost like wallpaper. You know, in the old, when we were kids, we would go to the wallpaper store and um, look through patterns, you know. Um, but they also did that for ceramics in like 18th century. And it's almost like the very wealthy are looking at this book to pick out like what images. But I tried to, add, to put images of war or, um, colonialism and things like this it, or heroicism against the war so it's like you're picking out uh you know yeah. images that wouldn't normally go with that behavior but right, um, right. you're sort of imagining your perfect world or how you would like yes, the, the response yes. to those bad bad things in that have happened um uh -huh. and then i thought it was really great to see this 
connection between the long yardage and then the long mm -hmm. tile that you designed for um, yeah. the show. So I think we probably, maybe we have one more minute for you to talk a little bit okay. about the connection okay. here. So this is like, this is the basis of the, the pieces that I did, the fabric at the fabric workshop, the tiles. Um, actually the motif I found, it, when you look at old Goya, um, the black paintings, when they found them, um, they knew they were in this farmhouse, the Quintus Sorto, but um, the, there was wallpaper around it, around the black paintings. And I, I sourced that, uh, to, to do this motif. So I call the piece that I'm doing Goya's Dream. So it's like this base of sort of terracotta in this pattern that might have been like his, that is his wallpaper, thinking mm -hmm. about the hallucination that he could have. And um, so it's about the, the, uh, the ceramic objects are more, are called potpourris and they would have, they, they're kind of reminiscent of a ship would have carried spices. Um, it's, a, it's a form that was used in the 18th century during the high, high colonialism. Um, so, uh, and then it ends with the, this billowing, um, the fabric will be hung on the ceiling in, in a billowing way and represent like the possibilities of peace by mixing indigenous motifs of, uh, of country before war and then the heroicism of anti-war figures yeah, um, yeah. in the vignettes. So it's, hopefully- it's so, it's so powerful and, and to translate all that information to the viewer in like that concentrated way. We're all very excited to see it in person. Um, the, the show itself is so exciting because it's like an installation after another yeah. and a tableau. And it's like a whole, it's a really interesting um, experience of, of one uh, ex one cubic experience after another. And it's going to be, I was so impressed with the installation so far. Yeah, so. that's great. Well, thank you so much, Jane and Christina and Karen Patterson, who couldn't be with us tonight. And thank you to Layla. I'll pass it back. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. I'm really excited to see the show. It opens next Friday. Um, before we introduce our next guest, I just want to say that I hope everyone will consider a donation to Craft Now so that we can continue to bring programs to you like this and advocate for the sector. And our last presenter tonight is, uh, our presenters, I should say, Hotbed Gallery on view through May 8th, Biospheres, is a collaborative exhibition by visual artists Margarita Hagen and Anna Viscara Rankin, curated by James Oliver Gallery. Uh, hotbed gallery owner Brian Hoffman is live in the gallery tonight and is going to host the conversation between the two artists about how their mixed media works and ceramic sculptures visualize what has enabled life to thrive for eons. Welcome everybody. Welcome to Hotbed. We're thrilled to have you here uh, virtually and we can't wait to see you here physically. We are open um, for appointments throughout the duration of this show and the space is activated and ready to receive you. So um, I'm Brian Hoffman and I'm gonna ask Anna East to throw up the presentation and we'll move quickly through that. There we go. So here's our uh, postcard. Um, you can go to the next one. Oh, sorry. We gave it away. So yeah, hotbed. Uh, we landed on the uh, purpose of our gallery throughout this last year. Uh, it's a, a catalyst and a conduit for futures not yet realized. And it's a big heavy purpose that we're very energized by. So um, you can clearly see how a future without biodiversity is not a future we want. And uh, we want to play off futures we want and futures that we may uh, do want. So um, that's where we want to be focusing. And, uh, you know, we're the place where art, design, and horticulture collide. So um, without further ado, I want to like kick it off. Oh, there's our gallery. This is what it looks like right now. So hope to see you all here soon. Here's another view. Um, we're doing some tableware and some other odds and ends here in the uh, club lounge. And uh, so that's a new exciting thing for us. And um, without further ado, I want to turn it over to Anna. I think Anna's first, right? Anna, do you want to take it away? Sure. 
All right. Thanks, Brian. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Anna Viscara Rankin. Uh, I make art about maps. Uh, we can we can stay on the first slide for a moment, um, but but this is good. Some of my maps are are uh, fairly easy to discern as such, um, but others are um, not so easily uh, deciphered. Um, so in this first slide, we have my latest world map um, still still in the first one. <laughs> My first world map is called The World According to Fishes. And it's a map that became popular through Reddit. And someone forwarded it to me because I paint world maps. Um, it measures about seven feet long by eight feet long, uh, by eight feet tall. I work with 96 inch cotton canvas that comes in 50 foot rolls. And um, this turned out to be a legitimate a global projection that's as accurate as any other world map that we use. And I became really taken with it. So um, you can see Antarctica is the, the center of this world map on the left. And the uh, it is centered around the oceans. Um, so this is this is a world map. Um, and uh, and then the other two pieces um, next to it are paintings of nebula. So the Rosette Nebula and the Lagoon Nebula, most people think of as what's known as astrophotography, but in fact, they're maps of um, uh, things that are occurring outside of the visible spectrum, such as hydrogen emissions and radio waves. And what we do is we represent them as colors. And, and in fact, these are representations of enormous amounts of light years of space. Um, now we're on to the second slide. And, uh, and that is a, a more easily readable world map. Um, as you can see, the South is at the top. And uh, all of my world maps leading up to the world according to fishes and my um, other two recent maps called red flags are oriented with the south at the top. I'm originally from Uruguay um, and the very probably best known um, Uruguayan artist um, is Joaquin Torres Garcia. And he drew a picture of South America with the south at the top, which is iconic throughout our country and inspired me to start making these world maps with the South at the top. So this world map shows um, all the text oriented so that it can be read um, with the world oriented with the South at the top. It is equally as accurate as a world oriented with the um, North at the top. Um, I have, however, renamed um, several land masses and uh, um, oceans and I mean seas mostly um, to reflect indigenous languages and uh, non-anthropocentric -anthrop words so that something like the Waddell Sea becomes the Narwhal Sea um, to kind of reconstruct the way that we think about these spaces. Um, so these maps Typically, I, I was showing were the, the large maps on um, cotton canvas um, that are monumental, but also very human sized. Um, but recently, um, the curators from Philadelphia Contemporary told me to start maybe showing some of these collage sketches. And now I'm really taken with sharing these sort of intimate explorations that I prepare before I actually do the larger pieces. Um, the most recent media that I've been engaging with, since this is a, a show a little bit about craft, um, on the, the next slide, I'm finally ready to move on, um, are these works that I'm using graphite to kind of trace what's going on in these structures that I am um, mapping out um, so that I can get a better understanding of how things work. All the way from 
subatomic particle um, dispersion when you try and split an atom into its parts. Uh, to the way anemones grow in the wild, which is what's going on on the left, to one of our best known supernovas, uh, the Crab Nebula, which is what's happening on the right. Um, so I um, carefully follow the patterning of these images so that I can get a better understanding of what that map will look like, and I can then translate it into a larger painting or a more complex drawing the way that I was, similarly the way that I was using collages as well. Um, let's see. So finally, um, my favorite kind of map that I think keeps me going um, are the uh, star maps. And uh, I'll, I'll try and be fast because I know I'm running behind. Um, so the star maps, I map out um, through naked eye stargazing. And, uh, and this one is, they're all eight feet by eight feet because that's my wingspan. Um, this one I mapped out last summer during the depths of the pandemic. Um, it was submerged in the ocean to size the fabric and uh, it's called Sleeping with the Tides. Um, it shows the Milky Way rising over the land mass. Um, in the Atlantic Ocean um, during the, one of the nights of the sea turtle migration, um, which means that everybody has to turn their lights off and you can actually start to see some of the color of the stars um, that are rising over the land in the Milky Way, especially if you stand in one of the tide pools. And it also refers to um, the segmented sleep that parents of young children get um, especially when you don't have a village to help you take care of your little ones. Um, so I think I, I got a little bit over, but I'll, I'll let Margarita take over. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Hanna. Hello, everybody, and um, thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you, Craft Now, for hosting Biospheres. Uh, this installation of Fauna Shields is inspired by murmurations that the flight of thousands of birds in one fluid mo movement. The wildlife work is inspired by nature's um, ingenious design and the convex ceramic plays on the idea of a shield, a thing of protection. Uh, and like a family crest, it honors the lineage of the countless species with which we share the planet with. And like the eye or a focus of a lens, the shields reflect our powerful role and reciprocal responsibility. The exhibit introduces flora joining fauna and the wildlife work. Next. So the flora, next slide. The flora trio is a tribute to our plant family who created our atmosphere and one of the key elements necessary for life on earth. Life is on the right and it was conceived in the spirit of a mandala and a tree of life, and it reaches above and below, straddling the realms of the seen and the unseen. The detail on the left shows a reflection of its interior world and ourselves as we peer inward. Life celebrates nine branches of the plant family with many shields within the shield, starting in the center where all life began at the microscopic level in the sea and moving clockwise around to include the most massive of any living organism, the giant sequoia. There's a legend available that maps out this complex piece uh, with more descriptions that you can see. So light is on the lower left and it reflects the alchemy and highly charged process of photosynthesis at the microscopic level. When the sun's rays penetrate the plant, the chloroplasts move in a frenzy, uh, but it's funnels or the light harvesting complexes is what ta really takes center stage. The photonic beams pierce the complex the complexes, splitting water molecules into hydrogen for the plant and creating and releasing the oxygen that creates our atmosphere. It's a wild and electric process and it's occurring all the time somewhere on our planet. Um, breath is the, the, there's a detail of breath on the upper left and it magnifies the stomata or the breathing portals on leaves. Leaves were developed to give plants more surface to catch their breath. Inhaling carbon dioxide and plants exhaled oxygen creating our own breath. 
This shield is inspired by the stomatas of lavender and lilac leaves. Next. So the Venus flower basket is the newest arrival in the La Mer series, and it's uh, under my marine uh, abstract series. And the La Mer obviously focuses on life in the ocean. And this is a silica or glass lace uh, sponge. It's named for the goddess of love, and it's a deep sea love story as a male and a female shrimp mate inside her in a lifelong symbiosis. The engineering of this sponge is so extraordinary. It's a model for the structure of high rise buildings. The fiber optic like silica threads that root to the sea floor house bioluminescent organisms and their light transports through the glass lace making her glow like a, a beacon at the 2000 to 3000 foot depths. Next. The foraminifera stars from microorganisms are installed around Anna's astro paintings in a marine Milky Way on the left. And the works on the right are installed with one of Anna's drawings chosen in response to her. But, but I chose them. They're, they're hanging together next to one of Anna's pieces, but they, I chose them for to really kind of um, respond to her crab nebula and anemone drawings that we just saw. And the stellate colony um, piece is for her uh, astro work. So we are in the time of epic shifts and we are responsible for the changes that are needed now. The work intends to uplift spirits, awareness, renewable action, and timely sustainable investments for all life. Thank you. Thank you, Anna and Margarita. I appreciate that. Yeah. You guys did an awesome job. Thank you. The work has been fantastic to see in person. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everyone. Be sure to get to Hotbed while the show is up and be sure to visit um, all of our presenters and follow them and see the work that they're doing. Um, I couldn't be more grateful for everyone that presented tonight. I learned so much and I'm just so appreciative for all the work you're doing in your communities and um, in the arts. So uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Please remember to follow us online and on social media. And with that, I'd like to invite everyone to unmute themselves and say hello and ask any questions that you might have. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you. Where are you joining you. from? Philadelphia, Fairmount. Fairmount, great. I'm Did a you tell the Fairmount accent? <laughs> <laughs> I see Nava, I see John Wind, I see Elisa. Who else do we have on our call tonight? Constance, Albert. Uh, I'd like to introduce our new Drexel co-op, Rafael Parsacala. He has been with us during a most exciting and busy week. So um, sometimes I send him a message. I'm like, just making sure you're okay. This is a lot of information even for me to take in. <laughs> Years. I'm having a good time. No, I'm I'm happy to be here. It's great to see everyone. It was, you know, it was cool to see the, you know, just a small overview and the dress rehearsal, but it was so cool to actually see everyone's work and get to know everyone better like that. Um, but yeah, I hope to get to know everyone a little bit more, uh, even better. And yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks for your help. Thank you, Layla and Raphael. You guys were wonderful hosts. Thank you. I don't know if Kimberly Camp is still on the call. She was a little late, um, but there is an opening. Um, Asaya might be able to help us uh, on Earth Day. Is that right? The unveiling of the new sculptures? Yeah, that's a new Buchanan. Oh, so, new yeah. So if you have any um, you know, questions about it, it gives you like a great overview. It talks about the, each of the sites, um, you can actually go to anewviewcamden.com. You can see a little video of the art that will be installed on Earth Day. That's when we um, do the ribbon cut, cutting. So, um, and 
just an FYI, if you didn't pick up on it, I am not from this area. I am from the South. So I say y'all and cutting <laughs> and just, you know, go <laughs> with it. Just go with it. <laughs> it was so great to hear you speak and to hear um, your mission at Camden Fireworks. Thank you. This I'm, I'm so excited to have met so many people tonight that are. Yes, doing yes me too. It makes, I can't wait to visit it. I agree. I look forward to learning more and visiting you guys, seeing your work in person. And that's so important about uh, the environmental, uh, you know, uh, pollution and dumping. I mean, I know about that, but it, to highlight it that way, it's really important. Yeah, we had yeah. recently, um, there was a big fire um, right around the corner from us, EMR fire. And I mean, it smelled like you were breathing in metal and chemicals and it was terrible. And um, just with the last um, storm we had last week, I mean, there was like sewage, sewage, like, like yeah. people were walking. So this is, this cannot continue. And I think that art is a good way to, to really kind of cut through everything else. Like, let's show it. Let's intervene let's look at it in a different way yeah okay. it's good to go. you know you guys have been planning that for a long time yeah. yeah everybody there's another um event tonight first thursday is that the whole title yeah, first, first thursday is on venture cafe yes so hop over there and you can see more gallery openings and hop around to the different tables and see what's going on in the fine art world <laughs> bye everybody Bye. Bye. Great to see all of you. Thanks for coming out. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks.